Hello and welcome to 21st Century Vitalism, a show where we're asking the question, what does it mean to be fully alive in the 21st century? I'm your host, Barrett Kane, a licensed massage therapist and meditation instructor and aspiring yoga teacher. In order to answer this question today, we are bringing in one of my good friends named Alex Beecroft to talk about some very important aspects of being a human. Uh, namely, uh, we spend quite a bit of time today on fatherhood, toxic masculinity, just the role of the man and the family and how we, we really need to reshape it and to incorporate the full being of the person rather than just what a traditional man is and shows up as. We also talk about the cultural divide here in America, as well as the importance of getting involved. Uh, this is a really fun conversation for me because Alex is one of my absolute best friends. Um, some people may know him as a passing thought. He's a poet. He's a farmer. He's soon to be a welder. He's a father of two beautiful boys. And he is, in my uh, humble opinion, a really wise, sweet, and gentle person. And I think that every time I talk to him, I'm always left with something else to ponder. Uh, he actually, I mean, is one of those people that every time we talk, it, it was one of the things that made me want to have a podcast so I could share just some of the points that we would get to. And, you know, it, it's honestly an honor to be able to like host my good friends such as him and to be able to give them a platform to talk to more people. And I definitely want to, you know, continue doing stuff like this. I think this is a really beneficial conversation for a lot of people. There's a lot of stuff here that just does not get talked about, but is pretty important. I mean, parenthood, fatherhood, these are very archetypical things. These are essential to so many people. Um, I mean, that's what our society's highest value is oftentimes is more than having a career. It's like having a family and, you know, there's just not enough conversation around the men, the man's role in that. So, you know, this was a really cool opportunity for me to be able to kind of see this through. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what we're going to be doing today. Um, some news on the horizon. Uh, some of you may know that I recently moved, uh, into a new space and surprise, I'm moving again. It's not that my current living situation is not awesome because it frankly is really cool. And I'm really pumped about my roommates and the space, but I did get an offer on essentially a full studio that would allow me to, um, you know, massage, uh, have a dedicated space for that. Uh, like I said, I'm a body worker as well as, um, a studio for filming. So, uh, phase two or three of the podcast, when I start rolling out the Patreon, I will be having video aspects to this. I, I don't really want to like uh, dive too deep because I kind of want it to be a surprise for uh, there's going to be a really big repush and rebrand and everything like that. But video is going to be a big part of it. So this allows me uh, the ability to produce high quality content. Um, and I actually just linked up with uh, one of my filmmaker friends. He actually just reached out to me and we're going to be collaborating on some things. So keep an eye out for that. I'm really excited about the future and where the show is going. I just without spoiling anything, I have some really incredible guests coming up that are going to blow your socks off because I am pretty floored with uh, the reception and just the vibe that I'm feeling and the, the openness and the momentum. And I'm really excited to be able to share this with you guys. Uh, this is a really fun project for me to do. And it's really showing, providing me an opportunity to show up in completely new ways. And I'm getting to meet a bunch of people that I frankly am truly inspired by. So um, yeah, if you want to hop on board the support train early, well, I guess as early as 21 episodes is, um, yeah, just head on over to Apple Podcasts, give us a, a subscribe, give us a good rating. That's currently the best thing that I could probably get right now, just in terms of maximizing my reach and beating the algorithms. I, I wouldn't say it unless it was something that was kind of important for this stage, um, we're also all up on YouTube now, so I'm working on creating some proto video things. I was relying on my podcast host to, 
um, they have a service where they like make a video for you, but it had their branding all over it. So I, you know, this is a one man job and I don't really have a lot of experience with editing or, I mean, audio I'm fine with, but you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes in the graphic design and video and I, I'm learning and it's been really cool to be able to piece this together Frankenstein style, but you know, uh, nothing but growth, nothing but momentum right now. And I'm really glad that you're here joining me on this specific episode because like I said uh, this guest is he's one of my favorite humans he's one of my best friends and um, I have full confidence that you're going to get something really juicy out of this because I definitely did even while I was listening to it again while I was editing I was like dang this is some good stuff so grab some tea do some stretches and settle in for this lovely conversation and I just want to let you know at the end there is a spoken word poem as well from Mr. Bacroft. It's really lovely, so I really suggest listening all the way through to catch that. So without further ado, please welcome Alex Bacroft. Alex Bacroft, hello and welcome to 21st Century Vitalism. How are we doing today? We're doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I had you in mind literally from the start, and I know we've talked about this uh, for a couple months now, and it's kind of surreal that it's already been so long to where here we are. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I just wanted to start off by pointing out that um, I had a prototype podcast that never released called The Lighthouse, and you were episode one, and yeah, it never released, but here we are um, pretty much like two years later Mm -hmm. with the real deal. So Mm -hmm. I'm really excited for this. Me too. Yeah. So um, for the folks who don't know you or, you know, know our relationship, I just have to say from my experience that um, literally everything that I have in Grand Rapids is kind of an auxiliary shoot because I know you and because, you know, we met at such a crucial time in my life. And so I just want to start off by saying thank you and I adore you. And I'm really glad to be able to provide this platform to um, just kind of like let people tap into the wisdom that you've uh, cultivated throughout the years because I really think you have a lot to share with folks. Well, that's that's really sweet of you. And it, it's a mutual gratitude and admiration because, you know, as much as like there have been crucial moments in time of like connection and, you know, relationships happening and electricity going through the circuit board, like it's all just been like a, one big story to watch every like you know everyone forge their relationships and and have this different synchronistic moments and to get to have just a little you know it's a wheel spinning right and if it's a little closer inside the wheel you get to see all this different motion on the outside of the wheel too and it's it's a real pleasure yeah so some of the stuff that i i, I that we have a a nice itinerary of topics to cover but something that i think you have an especially special or an astute um, insight into is fatherhood Mm -hmm. Um, for the folks who don't know and I won't say their names or give any specific details unless you want me to but you are the father of two twin boys Mm -hmm. who I think they're two now Uh, two and a half this month two and a half right so that is a very specific uh, vibe and energy. Yeah. And yeah, I just really wanted to open the floor because I see the way you interact with them and it is so inspirational and it gives me so much hope for the future of how people will interact with their children Mm -hmm. you know and i think like a grander conversation on just like the intricacies and subtle nuances of shaping consciousness Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. so yeah i i know you have some some poetry that um do you have something that kind of relates to this specifically or i do i i actually have a a piece that it's both for me and for the boys um so yeah, poetry is a bit of an undercurrent um, of a lot of where I've come to or how to come where I am right now. Um, so for those who don't know me, uh, A Passing Thought is also the, the, the name of poetry that I go by. Um, and you'll hear some of that peppered throughout this conversation, starting with this piece. I am not a man that strives to embody what you want of me. I am not your personal Plato personhood of putty. I do not poise myself to be the thing that you are projecting that I should be because I do not bend for you. I bend for me. If it is said that I am a reed in the wind, 
then let it be known that your whim is not what I give my limbs to. The whim of the wind that bends my limbs has its origin past the rim of the tick-tock of the clock because the breeze that moves my knees and knocks my heart to beat first started with that big shock of rhythm that with a big pop threw the galaxies into being. Yes, I am that I am wrought by my own hand, and I walk the sands and stones of the path that I chose. So if you still suppose yourself as knowing who I should be more than me, and sadly, you just must not be listening. I know it can be hard to hear through all that fear that could be clogging up our ears, but if you put down the cookbook, you might just realize the ingredients of personhood do not come from a recipe but are known to each and every one of us full well and intrinsically. If you honestly and sincerely want someone to become the best that they can be, if you really and for truly want someone to learn how to be happy, be it your child, your parents, your friends, your siblings, or other members of your family, then you have to realize that there is no greater guiding teaching than that of having a profound sense of self. And the person you're helping can only find that in the midst of sincere acceptance, not on the scorecard of your personal judgments. In the end, do not make ourselves shine in the sun. It's something we've always intrinsically done. So it is with our inner light. We just need the room to be our own kind of bright. Mm. I love that one so much. It's really cool to hear you say it um, now because I, I heard you say it on the solstice. Um, but we were in a different headspace, so it came out a little differently. <laughs> I'm sure it did. <laughs> Lovely solstice. <laughs> yeah, that homemade mead, though. <laughs> That's um, for the mead roll. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I really, I really like, I really like this, and I like the emphasis on like allowing the freedom to express as someone sees fit. How do you think that this applies to the idea of raising children? Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like a lot of what we do when we like step into parenthood is, is we just begin to like figure out where our own gaps were and we get really worried about those. Like we, we, once we're in such a raw role of adulthood as caring for another human being, the, um, your own irresponsibilities come out, your own traumas come out and you want to like safeguard your child from all of that and you begun parenting out of your own needs versus just being present with your child as they're going through each phase of development um and that's that's a subtlety that it, early life isn't as um it isn't as volatile as once there's really is personality once there really is like pushing of boundaries as they get older um even in just like my own stage that I'm experiencing right now, two and a half, it's, you know, we, we have entered this space where my own sense of like fairness and like of, for how they treat each other, for how they treat, you know, grownups in their home, like, you know, there, there, there's a certain needing to have boundaries for them, but too much boundaries and they begin to you know, they, their, their sense of sovereignty is taken away from them and you can begin inadvertently impressing, impressing patterns of you're not safe to make mistakes with, you know, your, you know, their access to your love is only conditional to their performance in these other areas. Um, and so really having an ethos of allowance and having an ethos of, you know, for me, that the, the defining part of that piece is the line like the um, the greatest guiding teaching is that of a profound sense of self, and that's that's what I got from my mom as I was coming up. You know, we, we had our own, 
we had our own challenges in the child parent relationship, but she, uh, from the time I was very little, she said, that if there was one thing she could always give me, it's just a, a strong sense of who I am. Um, and it occurs to me, you know, if you don't know who you are, then you are lacking the foundation you need to, to figure out what you want to do in the world for who you want to surround yourself with in the world, what your values are. So yeah, just having that profound sense of self, I think letting children be themselves as they grow up is, 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 is really crucial. And when we have our own images and projections that we're operating out of, we lose sight of that really easily and we begin to stifle that accidentally. Hmm. Yeah. And I almost feel like having like the sense of self, like when we talk about like what the self is, I think there's an inherent quality of curiosity and exploration that is a part of that. Mm -hmm. And I like the emphasis that you have on like not revoking your love and like not showing up in a way like you have to be able to set the boundary, but you don't want to clamp down on that sense of explore exploration. Mm -hmm. Cause like as the scent, the sense of self is expanding and trying to understand what exactly it is. If there is concrete walls on certain aspects of experience that could actually create more of that kind of deadening or like, it's like a trauma, you know, because mm -hmm. it's like an unlived aspect of what it could have potentially have been filling into so what exactly, how do you ensure that you set these boundaries while also fostering that sense of like exploration and curiosity and openness and clear um, reciprocal sense of love? Like what are, what are some clever ways uh, or examples that you might have for other parents? Um, in my experience, one of the really crucial things with boundaries is clarity and um, when I draw a boundary with the boys, I do my best to really try to simply explain why we can't do that thing and then use sim simple explanation every time it happens. You know, like one of our big fights right now is, is nap time because um, I feel comfortable using their names. Alder um, doesn't want to take naps, but he gets tired and his mind gets really prickly. And, and so I just sit with him to kind of, you know, remind him, this is what it feels like to be tired. So explaining to him why is like, what's going on emotionally for him. Um, Cause at the end of the day, you are their externalized nervous system. They don't mm. have the capacity to think I'm really tired. My need is sleep. All they know is I'm feeling away and I'm mad about it. <laughs> um, and, and so they need consent you you know and too like when he's upset that we picked up all our screen time and telling him you know the uh i i talk through the emotions with him i ask him like are you are you disappointed right now are you frustrated and over over the last few months he's getting more and more cued into being able to identify his own feelings um and so that's that's another i think the consistency and then letting boundaries themselves be an explorative place because you can't just let them go free, game, right? Like that is that, that that is not an option. They will they will hurt themselves. They will not develop healthy habits with their their own minds. Like there there needs to be it's like water. It need it needs a, vet, a container, but within that container there is a lot of room to move around. And so, you know, consistency and and letting them still see like why a decision needs to be made. Um. Mm. And, you know, it's, you can't expect them to understand it, but the importance is to begin presenting the pattern so that through repetition, they, be, they begin to cure understanding through like multiple iterations of it. And without consistency, those multiple iterations won't have as strong as a pattern. They won't understand what's going on as much, and they won't feel as strong of a sense of security when you as a parent are exerting the authority you need to. Wow. I really like the way that you're talking about this because it shows that you have a level of respect for your children mm -hmm. that I think kind of gets lost a lot with a lot of parents in mm -hmm. that we kind of like have this idea that like they're our kid and like they're an extension of us. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, oftentimes we don't treat ourselves very well. So as an extension, we don't really give them the same kind of grace or communicate to them that you know, like we're not able to have this be like a holistic open source kind of conversation. 
And the, the fact that you're like, you're introducing them to their emotions and inspiring the sense of self inquiry is just so unheard of. Like, as I'm hearing this, I'm like, oh my God, if everybody raised their kids this way, the emotional understanding of the world would be so much more, mm -hmm. you know? And what do you think has, I mean, this has to have came from like your self work. What do you think? How, how do we have more of an open dialogue about having these kinds of relationships with our kids? I, I think one of the things that would really foster more open dialogue around navigating this with kids is actually giving the parents more room to feel a sense of struggle and failure. Because I think one of the things that, um, I don't know, there's just, there's a strong guilt factor for not doing it right. So we don't, we don't necessarily want to talk about all the techniques we use or all the struggles we're having with kids because we don't want to have, be perceived as bad parents. Um, because we have the sense that the social expectation is that parents do it all right. They mitigate harm to the child emotionally and physically as much as possible. And to do otherwise is practically criminal. You know, every, I think every parent worries about the threat of someone seeing the way that they're interacting with a kid, not liking it and calling CPS. You know, and so we don't, we don't have much grace for parent, parental struggle, I feel. So when we do offer spaces of solutions, I think we just need to be really, especially to, you know, parents who have kids on the way, or people who are thinking about becoming parents, like being really real with folks about this, this is this is going to be the crucible of your life. You're going to have the worst parts of yourself come out because of the intensity of the emotions you're experiencing through all of this. And you have you have a threshold that you can and can't cross that's there, but it's not wrong for you to be pushed to that threshold. It's not wrong for you to be aware that your personal resources are the lowest they've ever been and your potential to do things out of character is at the highest it's ever been and mm. you're not a bad person for being in that state you're not a bad mom you're not a bad dad you're just human and here's some here here's here's as the human who has a more mature nervous system than the other human you're interacting with here's here's the things you need in your tool belt and the things you need to remain aware of I think that dialogue opens the space for parents a lot more than like, here's how you get a perfect kid because you can do that. Yeah. 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 It's, it's kind of a fascinating thing because I know, I mean, I'm not a parent, but I know that like every parent struggles with this. I mean, mm -hmm. we are still humans mm -hmm. and oftentimes we end up with children in a, when we're in a space where it's like, we may have not been prepared for it, you know, emotionally mm -hmm. or socially or, um, with the right community backing, you know, and, having that guilt of un not speaking about the experiences that you're going through, mm -hmm. you embody that and then you become it and then you give it to your children. Mm -hmm. It's like, it ends up being like transmitted through just you, the nature of your being. So I think like, yeah, you're right. Like having more conversation about what it means to be a parent in terms of the physiological aspects of it. Mm -hmm. I think having more of an understanding, but there's so much like cultural taboo and mm -hmm. shame mm -hmm. and you know, it, it, but it's such a human thing. It's like one of the most primordial human things, right. you know, and the fact that there isn't more clear, you know, awareness around this, it, mm -hmm. it really does baffle me. Yeah. And I, I feel like that really comes out. It, it's comes out for all parents. But I feel like that really has a lot of um, existential struggle for fathers because our role is traditionally so utilitarian. Like, I, I remember when, um, the the boys uh arrived you know all the paperwork that was given to us you know uh at the time um my partner's paperwork hers was all about um motherhood support network where she could tap into to help with the boys like all of that the only thing i got was a brochure telling me that my affidavit of Paternity was important because someone needs to pay for this child who, or these children who are now in the world. And that's it. Mm. The only thing I was told when I became a father that day well, was that 
I need to be good for the money. I need to be, I'm, I'm, I'm who needs to pony up. And, and there's nothing about the emotional support. There's nothing about the honor of becoming a dad. There's nothing about, you know, what successful strategies look like there, you know, not, not even for the nuclear model, much less a non-traditional family like mine, you know? So it, it's just, you know, we, we, I feel like we as men, cause like, that's the, that's one of the more prevalent tropes. Like it's, it's, it's daddy issues more often than mommy issues, stereotypically. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that comes out of just men in general, aren't given an emotional place. And because we don't have an emotional place, we are more apt to do emotional harm because we don't know how to manage our own emotional harm that we've experienced. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, men just don't have emotions, apparently. <laughs> right. It's like a weird, like aspect of our culture is that we just don't talk about men's experiences all that much. And I mean, I know right now we're seeing like a resurgence of the feminine and for just cause, you know, there's been a lot of harm done. And I think like airing a lot of these issues, bringing them to light mm-hmm. is important. But I think like at the same time, if we're having that conversation and we're not having the conversation mm-hmm. on providing space for men to come home to themselves mm-hmm. emotionally, mm-hmm. then we're kind of treating the symptom rather than the cause. Yeah. And it's like reintegrating like the divine masculine in every aspect of our lives. Yeah. And especially with child rearing, I mean... It, it, it's fascinating, you know, I, whenever I'm spending time with my dad, you know, he always has on this like old Western spaghetti Western channel. And I can kind of see just like the, the traditional culture of what masculinity is. And it's usually like the tough guy who comes in and doesn't say anything and he'll shoot his gun off mm-hmm. and then just like kind of womanize slightly. And like, that is the, the psychology that we've been implanted with. That is like the traditional make America great. Like that's what that's pointing to is like that kind of masculinity. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's why I think like where you're at in the way that I, I, when I see like, I feel like you're like a torchbearer. I don't mean to like, you know, blow smoke up your butt, but like, I feel like you really are on the frontier of reframing what fatherhood is Mm -hmm. going forward, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I think every new dad is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and two, no matter how old your child is, it's never, it's never too late for you as a dad to also, you know, start embracing that. Like I, you know, I know for me and my mom, like this is a year where we're really going to tap into some of our trauma and I'm, you know, a 28 year old child, she's a 50 some year old mom. And we're, you know, you can still go back to, um, the old business to hash out what you want new to look like. Um, I feel like another really good potent thing to tap into is to reframe what adjectives we associate i mean it's really useful for fathers right especially new dads people coming into the world like really highlighting what the adjectives you want associated with your fatherhood to be and by extension even just as men we can do this you know what 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 are the adjectives you want masculinity to look like and i i I would i would argue one of the one of the really nuanced places to make a switch for all of us men is to take the adjective of strong and replace it with compassionate. Mm. Cause often at the end of the day, what we're trying to utilize strength for in our image, um, is usually actually what's coming from a place of compassion. You know, you don't provide for others because you are so strong that you can like bring all this in and, and be so strong to give it out. It's, you know, when you come from a place of compassion, you see the needs of those around you and you want to work to fulfill that. And th- th- those are two different subconscious operating. Patterns. Yeah. I like that a lot. The idea that like we should maybe be seeking adjectives. I don't think a lot of people really have taken that kind of meta approach. You know, it takes a level of like, what are the themes that you want to be bringing into your experience of fatherhood? And even just like as a quick exercise, you know, if you like come up with three words, it can give you a really good compass as to like where you are and how you're showing up, you know, like the first thought, best thought kind of thing of like, okay, so like, yeah, the idea of strong, you know, Mm -hmm. I think even like the idea of like a provider kind Mm -hmm. of comes from a compassionate place, Mm -hmm. you know I mean? And that is kind of, that's what like they were giving you like here's how you can be a provider and within that there's some wisdom but it, it's so detached from the heart of the lived experience of it mm-hmm. that you know i i think yeah compassion 
think grace would probably be another one, right? To be mm-hmm. graceful, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. like, you know, I think that that's that's another really big aspect of it. Yeah. And then and then we're touching the boundary of like. Not only are are the adjectives of what you wanted to be like, what identify what adjectives you perceive as not allowed. You know, Mm -hmm. a dear friend of ours recently made this post, and I think it's so true of men think of thinking of ourselves as beautiful. You know, of embracing Mm -hmm. that we have. You know, grace kind of peters on that threshold of elegant and you know sublime and just all the these words that are like liquid beauty, and it's just like unless you you've begun to reorient around masculinity and the, the traditional masculine looks at those qualities and it's really foreign. Mm-hmm. And, and, and there is something to be said for, it just speaks to the nature of the womb when beauty seems removed from identity. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's an innate human experience to be able to perceive beauty and to embody beauty. And like beauty isn't just necessarily like physically appealing. It's like, the manifestation of good qualities. When you Mm -hmm. see someone doing good in the world, it's a beautiful thing, Mm -hmm. you know, like the work of Gandhi, like that was a beautiful force of nature. And, you know, we could really reframe beauty to incorporate things that are more traditionally masculine. These things don't have to be, you know, separate. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the word, I mean, now that, I mean, I feel like we're, we're like kind of dancing around it, but the idea of like toxic masculinity, um, especially with like fatherhood, like where do you think, do you, do you believe in toxic masculinity? What would be your your take on that? Um, I absolutely I absolutely believe in toxic masculinity, and that, uh, congruent to that, I absolutely believe in the toxic form of anything. Really, um, mm-hmm. there is a way to have toxic femininity. There's a way to have toxic spirituality. A way to have a- a- any 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 quality that that you try to identify. And thus, like, adjust relative to has an opportunity to become toxic for you. Um, in terms of where we get it from, I feel I feel like a lot of it is, um, I kind of view our society as the, the most modern iteration of empire. And if you mm-hmm. look at the behavior of empire long term, it makes sense that the masculine nature has for so for toxic masculinity it has these reflections of aggression ownership um and control because those are the same qualities that war and soldiers need and our our you know we we can't make the mistake of thinking that our culture was made you know in our grandparents time like our cultures was made you know, on battlefields and in occupied cities across spans of thousands of years. And, and, and we're living in the acute accumulation of that called the present in the United States of America. Hmm. So what do you think are some like, I feel like for a lot of the people who may be on the fence of like, they're in what we would maybe consider toxic masculinity, but are starting to get like a kernel of awareness about just like, oh, like some of my behaviors might be actually harming those around me. How do we frame this conversation in a way that maybe is best um, able to kind of seep into that psychology? Do you do you think you have any ideas on just like how to ease people into this conversation without triggering all the defenses of it? Because mm-hmm. like, I feel like I, I'm always looking at the the edge of where we are and like the edge is like that that space of disillusion between like okay if toxic masculinity then healthy what Mm -hmm. does the line look like and how do we pull the the fringe to the side of like in balance Mm -hmm. you know like how do you think we can best do this Mm -hmm. the first thing that comes to mind is kind of an affirmation of the men in their lives because i feel like sometimes the the pushback against um the conversation around toxic masculinity is, you know, yeah, my dad's da da da, but he really cared for us. Or like, yeah, my dad had some character flaws, but like, there's all these ways he was a great influence, and you know, because of that, I'm not so sure I, I buy this. And I think, I think we, you know, because too, like, you know, 
toxic masculinity feels like a big heavy word that's applying to your entire identity and you need to do a complete remodeling in order to like address it when that's not really it's it's all it's all a gradient it's all modicums of degrees like if if you're you know if if you're violent you know if you're violent you're violating and you're just vitriolic yeah you're probably on the far end of the scale where like this whole conversation applies to you but many of us just have these aspects of our lives that that there's some toxicity at work in but it doesn't mean like we are a toxic person. We are like a bad person. And I feel like most people push away from things that they feel like are are trying to characterize them as all of these terrible things when, yeah, there's a couple of these problem areas, but overall, like I try to treat the people around me the best I can. Like all around, I try to just generally be a good person in the world. Like, you know? But yeah. I, I think that's one thing. And then, I think I think the positive examples help um, in as much as they're relatable to the person they're being communicated to. That's where, like, I feel like drawing out, like we were talking provider and compassion. Like, you don't you don't have to get rid of provider in your head in, if if that's how you relate to your masculinity, but have it come from a compassionate place. You know, that's taking mm. where you're at now. That's taking where you're just a very small step to where you're going. Because a lot, a lot of the toxicity I think that comes out in subconscious thinking is, is just that subconscious, and thus very nuanced and increment changes make very big difference over time. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that that's kind of like where kind of some of the downfall around the the toxic masculinity comes in because there are definitely actors out there who paint it in a way that like completely demonizes and i think as soon as someone feels like they're being turned into a caricature they become defensive and then hardened and then that becomes a buzzword that they will then push against oh yeah whereas i I don't i don't know if this is exactly what you're saying but the way that i usually approach a lot of this stuff is like addressing and drawing boundaries about the toxic behavior not allowing them but also speaking to the good because that actually creates like a positive feedback loop to where like people feel seen and heard because most people think they are good people. Mm -hmm. So if you can really reaffirm the parts of them that are good because no one is wholly bad, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there's maybe a few people out there who have sunk really low, but like everybody has a a kernel of goodness. And if you can breathe light to that and bear witness to that, Mm -hmm. then I think that they will naturally feel your openness to them. And then that will in turn open them up to you. And then it creates a a lot more malleable of a situation rather than like, we need to cut this person down, you Mm -hmm. know, like that does not create lasting holistic results. No, you know, no. And it often, it often seeds more division. Um, one, I, I, I really like you're talking about honing in on what's good because we know physiologically when someone experiences defensiveness, frontal cortex shuts down. They like literally the physiological parts of your body that are responsible for carrying your higher thinking functioning, zilch, not yep. online. Yep. So when, when we are demonizing groups of people and people in the group that we're demonizing see that and they're just like, hmm. No, like that, that is, that is really the source of so much division, even just beyond Mm -hmm. the, the toxic masculinity conversation, but just in our, in our society at wide, there is a a huge gap between the cultures of urban and rural America. And and it, it really is coming from this place of, there's a large contributing factor, I should say, that is just the perception of people in rural communities as folks seeing them as dumb as seeing them as just dimwits and just you know and i frankly like i i tend to run in further left circles than i do further right and it's the most benign way it ha- it happens across the board but the most benign way i see it is in the statement this is on both sides is how can someone even Da, 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 da. Like you yeah, are beginning yeah. your sentence, making their thoughts seem so outlandish that it must only be through fantasy or imbecility. And it, it doesn't, yeah, it just doesn't leave the person it's about any room 
to feel, I guess, good about what they think. And that's tenuous because sometimes you really do need to call in something that needs being called in, or you really do need to point out how, how much of a cognitive dissonance is at play. But at the end of the day, you've just got to choose your strategy because, yeah, just characterizing what they think is just unfathomable to any critical thinking human being mm -hmm. is, is not going, it's not going to be the road you get to them through. And if anything, yeah. you're just going to use an example of them as a shame-based example for those around of what not to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're really talking about like a subtle nuanced alchemy of interacting with other people and like mm -hmm. understanding the physiology and how you can best show up with your nervous system to actually allow your message to land. And I don't think that that's where a lot of people kind of come from. And I mean, I feel like if your stance requires them to denounce their character, they're never going to listen to you, <laughs> right. you know? So like finding creative ways to maintain your level of openness. I love the Ram Dass quote, which is in order to protest effectively, you must love the other that you're protesting as much as you love yourself. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's spiritually bypassing or just like, we love everybody. It's to literally like to acquiesce your nervous system to be open and to not allow other people to offshoot your nervous system. So it's like that level of lovingness, you're not closing yourself down just like you are with your kids. You know, and you can shut down ignorant thoughts with, um, you know, careful, precise um, instruction or guidance. But if your nervous system closes down, then their closes down, and then you get this budding of heads that we're always seeing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the rural and urban divide, I mean, it's it's honestly, it's the liberal conservative divide. I mean, oftentimes, and frankly, like, I, I know a lot of folks who would say that they're conservative who work very hard and have more traditional family values, and they're not bad people. Mm -hmm. You know, they would give you the shirt off their back. Mm -hmm. You know, like, there is goodness in there, but... And it's the same vice versa, you know, for them, for a lot of people, they see like the, the elites and the urban elites, you know, and they're like, they have no idea what life is like for me. You know, mm -hmm. they're just like pompous, snooty. They think that they can just, you know, make all this legislation without considering me. And it's, it's the same dynamic back and forth, you mm -hmm. know, and I just, I, I, I have a lot of like theories, you know, but I haven't really put it into action on how to have a conversation and understand each other. Mm-hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. I think there, for me, at least my take on it, there's a weird, it's really about identity. And conservatism is really, I think, the last bastion of the American identity. Um, for those of us that are recognizing the intense way, like the history of the United States has caused a lot of social fracturing has been exploitive has and not what we were raised believing it to be you know we um we don't feel an existential threat from the very very different times we're heading into whereas conservatism and you see it all over their hallmarks right like traditional family values sticking to the constitution like you know american tradition and preserving the american identity and prosperity like those that that kind of thinking is all centered around keeping something intact mm -hmm. um and and there are there are ideological components of conservatism such as you know small government you know restricted spending like uh, you know deregulated market but when you really look at the behavior of the political leaders of the conservative movement that's not really their ideology right and, and i'm sorry it's typically corporate socialism and then rugged individualism for mm -hmm. the individual mm -hmm. you know that's the conservative policy decisions that typically get made and the democratic too if we're being okay. honest yeah no if, if we're getting into this discussion it should just be said the democratic party is also just like got a ton of its problems and it's not the the established democratic party is not interest is about as interested in the well-being as everyday americans as the established republican party i mean they're two heads of the yeah. same beast in many ways but there is um 
I don't know. It's a very much so like a look at this hand and don't watch what I do or this hand kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Cause, cause yeah. you, you know, it's just, it's for me, it gets me with their, their talking points, right? Like we're about like people on the right tend to talk like we're, we're populist. We're for the people. We're for working class. We want to make it, make a market where anyone can succeed. Everyone can pull themselves up by the bootstraps, but they've, but yet government has engineered a society that basically keeps people enshrined in their debt. And as long as people are enshrined in their debt, the upper mobility of the lower and middle class is, is greatly stemmied. Wages have stagnated. Cost of living has gone through the roof. Like, And it's all come down from like these, you know, trickle down economics was terrible for us. Like taking taxes away from, you know, the higher income brackets was terrible for us. Like, the 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 codification of corporate personhood was terrible for us you know the the the, uh, the suppression of working wages through the the minimum wage has been terrible for us like all all the actions that have come to pass nafta was awful for us you know it's all all the things that have hurt the working class that have come to pass have happened under just as much the leadership of the right as the left. And so that, that working rural class folks are, are, which are, you know, the bread and butter of the conservative party, the fact that they, they, they feel so favorably towards the conservative party, quote unquote, versus like the liberal, like it's just, I, I, I feel bad because I feel like people I identify with, because that's my roots are being duped by people who really genuinely do not care about them and are making decisions that will continue to actively hurt them. Case in point, West Virginia, right? Like coal is not something we can keep running with. Fracking is not something we can keep running with. We know that our dependency on oil is not long-term healthy for us as a society. And instead of being, um, you know, having a sense of duty towards their workers, you know, if, if they had a sense of duty to their workers, the coal companies would be training their workers to be able to go into industries post coal or go into a green renewable mm-hmm. energy, still be in the energy sector and still be able to work in the same industry in their home. But instead, they just spend all of their money lobbying politicians and running emotive, like, you know, emotional push button campaigns about why we need to keep coal, why we need to keep the mines open. And never never taking the time like they care about making their money so much that year that they don't want mm-hmm. to take the time that year to set up the long game to be better for everybody around them yeah well i think especially with coal and i mean these other dying fossil fuel industries is kind of comes down to like i mean they're squeezing as much of the energy out of their workers as possible when they know that the ship is about to hit an iceberg mm-hmm. like we all know it it's just a matter of time before this industry dries up mm-hmm. but they're not about like transformation they're about squeezing as much money out of it and probably retiring Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know it's Mm -hmm. it's not about what's best for the society and you know i I think about that question or the idea that like well like why are these people especially in rural communities subscribe to an ideology that is actively harming them and i think a big part of that is like you typically see more liberal folks in cities. And I think there's something about living in a city or living amongst a wide selection of people that kind of opens your eyes to other ways of life and other factors. Whereas Mm -hmm. if you're living in a small rural town, you're only operating within a small social sphere of people who probably all look like you to some degree, Mm -hmm. you know? So like you're not getting a lot, your, your diet, your social and ideological diet is very narrow and specific. You've been chewing on the same idea for the past 40 years because you're not interacting with people who are studying other things, you know? Mm-hmm. So it almost is kind of insidious in that, like, I think, like, the the Republican Party has specifically targeted those folks. I mean, especially with, you know, like the Electoral College, it doesn't matter mm-hmm. if you have more folks. It just matters if you have the right area of folks, Yeah, you know? Well, one of the things that's important to remember with the right is that they they didn't convince many people to join them. They engineered a lot of people to join them. In the like Reagan era, it was, or just before, they, they basically started running this campaign where they went for local school boards. And they got people with their ideolo- ideology elected to local school boards. 
And then it became a overtime cascade effect. And that's how the religious right became the powerhouse that it is, is they just started at the bottom and worked their way up. And so now it's not just an ideological persuasive argument that's gotten people into the right. It is just the identity they've been raised with and the identity of the institutions that raised them. Mm. If you look at Marxist doctrine, if you actually look at look the, the the founding ideology of what goes behind communist thought, one of the things that's really prominent is the idea of a false consciousness. That the working class or the owning class has essentially through social means, force this false identity onto the working class that keeps us where we are, that keeps us content mm. in a situation where we have to labor and they enjoy ownership. And this is a great case in point of that. You know, we've 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 been raised to think that this is a raise yourself up by the bootstraps economy that anybody can become a millionaire in. And that's so utterly not true. And in the few cases where it does happen, what happens is people see that and like, oh, there's a case all the way over there. Like one case out of like the thousands and thousands of people I've ever met. So it is possible. I mean, no, there, 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 there are not for everybody, right? Like, like most likely they got that through an unethical means. Even if you work hard and build a business up, it's hard to prove that your your business doesn't have an exploited cost somewhere along the lines. Even if you build up a manufacturing business, if you are getting raw metals from a mine that is exploiting human labor to get them, or computers or circuitry, like you, you are still compliant in, in on an ethical means of accruing your wealth and anyone that accures wealth through unethical means should not be modeled after. Right. Right. But we don't really place importance on the means as much as like the thing at the end of the means, mm -hmm. you know? So like we always see like the success story without the, the journey that that person had to take and the corners that they must have had potentially have cut, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of another part that kind of comes down to our original conversation about like the provider father you know like it kind of justifies a lot of bad behavior you know oh, it's yeah. like i provide for this family i bring in all the money and you know like they might be an asshole though and it's like what we need more than the end goal is an ethical way to get to that end goal right you know so tying it all together you know it's it's more about the path than it is about the outcome mm-hmm um, mm -hmm. but yeah. how do we, I just don't know how, and this is, this is funny because I, I felt myself on the edge of asking you this back when I did the lighthouse podcast, I literally opened it up with like, yo, the world's screwed up, man. What do we do? <laughs> so like from your estimation, I mean, as I'm talking to you, I, my, my leaning is that like education, 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 understanding, mm -hmm. understanding, understanding. Mm -hmm. I think that these are the things like trying to seek to understand the other person in which that we're protesting against, mm -hmm. but then also in educating ourselves to the systems in an accurate and clear way mm -hmm. so that we don't cause harm. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're seeing this kind of on like both sides, you know, even good intentions can have really disastrous outcomes, oh, you yeah. know? And I guess f for you, what, yeah, this is like a, a large scale question, which I don't expect the most accurate answer. But like, what do you think we should be able to do on an individual basis? I mean, for our future generations, for, you know, just a more ethical way of interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, that's a big question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big one. And there's a couple there's a couple pathways for it that have been turned into our discussion that I kind of wanted to bite into a little bit. Um, definitely, definitely the education is crucial. And, and not not just reading everything that's out there, but like deep critical thinking, almost even more than education. Like because your critical, you know, education is what you learn, but critical thinking is how you learn it. And so, if you're not learning content in a way that scrutinizes author and argument, you can wind up just 
absorbing information for the sake of absorbing information and operating out of it without any kind of a real digestion of its of what it means of like whether it's really true or not or whether or not it really aligns with your values so even even in pushing education you need you need to push the the questions and the mind you you operate out of while you're learning um i see i see a lot of that actually happening in it's not an exact reflection, but I see that ethos in the spiritual community and how we talk about abundance. Because, you know, there's there's all these folks that talk about, and I just, I so cringe at this, this title, but like there's this thing around going around now of like arigato money and like just the, the this ethos of attracting abundance that's kind of been building over the last, you know, five, 10 years. Um, and it's like everyone, you know, yes, like there are, uh, there, there are principles of, of reality that you can tap into with mental focus and attention and, and affect different planes so that you begin to see results on the plane of causality that we live on. And you, you can call that, a, you know, calling in and manifesting your abundance. Sure. And you can do that, right? Like you can make that happen, but you're not addressing the system that you made that happen within. And so you might have all this money now, but what are the ethics that you that you now like tap into? Like you know, there's some people out there who they, they, they do this abundance manifesting. They turn around to teach other people how to manifest their abundance. And they say, if you really want to do your spiritual work, you'll pay $2,000 to sit with me for a weekend. <laughs> and it's like, okay, hey, you're implicitly saying that anyone who isn't willing to pay $2,000 isn't willing to do their work. That's bullshit. Yeah. But then two, like, you, so... You, if you're really engaged with a holistic spiritual life, you have a natural call to activism, in my opinion. You have a natural call to activism. You have a natural call to be working for the benefit of all other life. Because you Piece are all other life. Like <laughs> working for the benefit of everything else is working for the benefit of yourself because it all is all one. And so if like, I, I am really skeptical to think that anyone who is operating with this like arigato money mindset and i'm not saying it's impossible but i'm just saying it. i'm much more skeptical that they are actively desirous to dismantle the vehicle uh, uh of the kind of economy we're living in that is oppressing so many people not just in our nation but globally once you're financially comfortable, if you can just manifest your abundance, like where is your impetus for like, frankly, like positive interest rate is one of the most fundamental mechanisms destroying the world around us right now. But if you have a bunch of money and your positive interest rate is giving you that percentage on the wealth you already have every in your savings account to give you, you know, your regular trust fund, whatever, or your regular allowance of like thousand bucks because you got all that other money in the bank, it just makes itself. Your impetus for dismantling that system, is n I'm incredibly skeptical to think you're actually operating at that. So you're saying that Joel Osteen is not a saint? Honestly, I, I catch whiffs of like ideas as they're coming on the currents. My mom's a spiritual director, so it's a lot of like, she hears a lot of trends. I, I don't know the actual people. I know the Mind Valley guy has gotten okay. into it. Yeah. I don't know. Well, okay. So like Joel Osteen is one of those like mega church speakers who I think during COVID he ended up getting this like multi-million dollar relief and like he already has this mega oh my church, God. his own yeah. private uh -huh. airline uh -huh. and, you know, he prophetizes, you know, being able to save people. He's like one of those kind sure. of types. Um, yeah. I, I think that there's like definitely like a healthy middle ground in that. Um, I mean, and I'm only saying this is like uh, someone who's going to like meditation teaching and that is like a service I'm going to charge for. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's not going to be an exorbitant amount. And it's simply right. for the fact of like you, you, you'd pay for someone to teach you guitar or you'd teach right. someone to pay or you'd pay someone. So like making your ends meet is a different thing than I also have someone and I'm not going to name them in my feed. I've unfollowed them because I was so sick of 
the the advertisements they were putting out where it was like i'm going to teach you how to call in abundance it's only a th- it's literally seven hundred dollars i'm going to sell you over over the phone reiki for three hundred dollars and it's just like all these things and it's like dude you're manipulating people who are potentially hurting mm-hmm. and like as someone who is like a body worker you know that frustrates me to no end you know yeah and i mean if you if your ability to call in abundance is helping other people to call in abundance without having done it on your own in an ethical manner then like you just shouldn't be teaching <laughs> no no you shouldn't and i you know so with my mom being a spiritual director um we've had a lot of conversations around like the you know the ethics of of you know charging a fair price for your services that you've invested in, that you've been educated in, that have a certain, you know, I can appreciate with your body work, like a session for you isn't just the session. It's also the impact it has on your body for the surrounding day. Like there, there's components mm-hmm. of that, that you, that you out of a place of healthy self value need to make sure are covered. Um, what becomes dangerous is when people think that they can just manifest their abundance by setting these super high prices that people who want to do the work are going to pay when in actuality, you're just going to get a bunch of upper middle class folks who are going to give you this mm-hmm. bubble perception of it, who they really are hurting on the inside. Like they have their own whatnot they're going through that make them really susceptible to you, the presence. Like you represent something mm-hmm. to them that they want to be. And as long as you can put on, you know, as long as you're believing yourself that to be, they'll continue believing you're that. But if the reality of it is anything different, then you're dangerous. You are just flat out dangerous. Yeah. And I think like it's a double-edged sword in that you're not only hurting your clients, but you're also hurting yourself because you're making yourself kind of disingenuine in that you think, because I mean, I'm sure a lot of these people actually believe in the work that they do mm-hmm. um, and have just gotten like a viral bug implanted in their head that like, this is the way they need to carry it forward. But, you know, I, I literally said on the last podcast, and I'm going to say it on this one that like, the most radical thing is accessibility. If you truly want to be radical, if mm-hmm. you truly want to be mm-hmm. a a torchbearer for whatever it is that you're doing, make it accessible. And like, don't worry about, and that's the other thing about like manifesting abundance. The more that you worry about it, the more that you're focusing on abundance, you're not only just pushing it away, it's becoming a neurotic thing. Mm -hmm. You have to trust that it's coming Mm -hmm. rather than like finding ways to finagle it. That's like, it's an after effect of the work that you do that is good, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. That shouldn't be your end, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I, I see it so much with, I mean, there's definitely, I mean, spiritual materialism is like a super real thing that the West, I think, is kind of learning how to navigate. I mean, it's kind of always been there. I, right. I see it's, it most often with new new age thought. Yeah, it's, the, it's but, the new prosperity gospel. Yeah, yeah. Could you explain that real quick? Sure. Um, so prosperity gospel was mostly an evangelical phenomenon of like the mid to late 1900s, where the idea was if you're in alignment with God and you're praying about it, you know, God will be your best business partner. And if you're mm-hmm. su- financially successful and you believe in the prosperity gospel, it's it's like it's like a your wealth is like a credential for your like contact to divinity. And if you're, gotcha. and if you believe in the prosperity gospel and you don't have that, well, then what's wrong with me and my relationship to God? Kind of a thing. It's kind of a re- recapitulation of the idea that like we had a drought, the the rain god must have not, you know, mm-hmm. had favor with us. Right. You know, it's kind of like the same. Or you got sick. Logic, you know. You know, there are yeah, a lot of yeah. old ideas around illness had to do with, oh, you got sick, you must have sinned. I'm sure there's some people out there who are looking at COVID with that kind of mindset too. <laughs> right. They're the great cleansing. <laughs> there are. There That's actually amazing. are. Yeah, yeah. It's it's amazing the the. I mean, talking about toxic gradients, you know, I mean, that's kind of another thing, you know, like spirituality has that toxic, I mean, it's just like the extreme, there's Mm -hmm. like the two extremes, you Mm -hmm. know, and it's really gross when you see it in the spiritual sense, because, you know, I, again, this is another Ram Dass thing, it's like you've traded out iron shackles for golden shackles, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, you're still shackled, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, you just have an identity structure that's based around these spiritual philosophical principles, and 
you know, it's, it's a bummer, you yeah. know, it's, yeah. it's kind of sad. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I remember I read this one book from um, Why Not Be a Mystic by Frank X. Gawati. And one of the things that like always stuck with me from that book was just the recognition that like your the things you're trying to overcome in your spiritual journey are always going to find a way to reincarnate at every stage of spiritual development you take. And what becomes difficult is the longer you're on a spiritual path, the more spiritual in nature those reincarnations can become. Mm. So how do how does that look like in your life then? I guess maybe an example just to really highlight that. Oh, not me. It doesn't have to be from your life, <laughs> no, I'm but good. um let's see. Well, I mean, frankly, actually, that one might work. Um for me, there's there there's kind of a pointed example in my relationship to um psychedelia, because mm. there have been times where in like you have this really potent tool for spiritual exploration that's available to you. And when you first begin to explore, it, it is very innocent and it is very, you know, it really is the sense of exploration and what is this? And well, what do these other channels of the radio feel like when I, you know, when I retune the antennae? Um, but then there, there with famili familiarity becomes the ability to, you know, you're taking a spiritual tool and then you're just you're just kind of doing it to do it. And so it becomes the next resting place for your addictive personality, or it becomes the next resting place mm -hmm. for your fear of silence and stillness. Um, and so, you know, instead of diving into this other arena that your spiritual work is really calling you into, you just go back to this other more familiar place that blows the head open. And yeah, it, it, it helps you at one stage of your life. Now it becomes the vehicle with which you ignore the work you need to do now. Mm, yeah. I think that that uh, fits the outline of kind of that quote pretty well. And I would agree. I mean, that was kind of, I think that's something that every uh, psychedelic mystic will end up running into. At least they probably should. Otherwise, they just become like a lot kid, and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. kind of like one of the lost boys in right. Peter Pan, just forever chasing that golden dragon, if you will. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it, it's an interesting dynamic, and I honestly think that like everything kind of mirrors that in the spiritual path as well. You know, mm -hmm. like even something like following your breath. After mm -hmm. some point, even the breath will need to be let go of in mm -hmm. order to go to the next mm -hmm. stage, you know? And, mm -hmm. you know, even sometimes deep meditation and retreat could be that thing, you yeah. know? So, like, it, it's always shifting, yeah. you know? It's and, whatever the moment is requiring of you. Yeah, and so, in some ways, the entire spiritual path is that. Because at yeah, the end of the yeah. day, the entire spiritual path is leading back to the ever-present here and now. Like it's only ever to mm -hmm. be aware of something that's already there. It's not helping you make a tool for getting to it. It's not helping you do a fancy technique or bend of your body that will then align. No, it's te the, yeah. the spiritual path at the end of the day is leading back to wherever you are, whenever you are. Yeah. Before enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. <laughs> uh, After enlightenment, chop, chop wood, wood and carry, carry water. water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Alex, I think this is our time for the day. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah. I, I really appreciate you. And this is definitely not going to be the last time you're on the show. So. Well, thank you for having me. It was a joy and a pleasure to be here with you and get to see, you know, have a little full circle moment from one podcast to the next. Yeah, yeah. And then maybe the next one, and maybe the next one yeah, for all of eternity. <laughs> well, hopefully, at least a few awesome. solstices from, you know. Yeah. <laughs> still work, still work those Wonderful. In. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Awesome. Well, be well, my friend. Mm -hmm. We'll talk to you soon. Love you. Talk to you soon. Love you. Oh.
All right, so that was the episode. Thank you so much for listening all the way through. I really make this show for you. I truly mean that. If you wish to support us, head on over to Apple Podcasts, subscribe, give us a review. You can do the same over at YouTube or whatever streaming service you're using. Reviews are great, and it shows that you're listening and, you know, that you care and I love you. Um, Like I said at the beginning of this episode, there is a poem, so I'm going to let y'all go early. Catch us the same time next week, Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And keep an eye out for uh, new updates coming. There's a lot of new things I'm going to be putting in place here with this new studio space. So um, look forward to connecting with y'all. All right, bye. I see a lot of people looking for peace. In holy dogma or holy diction, in the words of holy swamis and holy inscriptions. I see a lot of people looking for peace in bars, cars, and shopping carts, buying and consuming just trying to fill that room in their hollow hearts. I see a lot of people looking for peace in drug-induced numbness or sex, Confusing pleasure for spiritual progress. I see a lot of people looking for peace in a good job with high pay and housing in a ritzy place, building their temples on the grounds of the holy rat race. All of these peace seeking people ceaselessly search through this that and the other trying to discover the magical code that once uncovered can unlock the world of the holy and sublime but time after time their efforts end in naught because despite all we think we know and all we've been taught We've forgotten that the peacefully prone are not those that seek for things outside themselves, but are the ones that realize that peace arises inside the self. The truth of peace is not something we learn. The place of enlightenment It's not something we earn. That placid place of serenity already exists within each component of any given moment. It lives in a laugh. It lives in a tear. It lives in the dunes. It lives off the pier. It lives in a brush. It lives in a beer. It lives in our hopes, and it lives in our fears. It lives in that all-pervasive, harmonious hum that has rung out since the universe had first begun, and hearing it is not a matter of what we are doing or what we have done, but it's a matter of how open the ears of the heart have become. When we mire ourselves in material matters or submit to socially conditioned patterns of life, we can deafen ourselves to that harmonious hum. And we lose sight that ourselves and truth are actually one. We are peace. We are serenity. We are a ubiquitous constant of truth. And in the end, our egos and spirits and all the temporary things we defiantly declare as our being are just leaves sitting on a tree of life. Simple pieces of a greater interconnected sum that has neither start nor stop in truth. Truth is in the bark and in our limbs and in the roots and in our hearts and 
if we can just stop thinking about breathing and step back and simply breathe and simply be we'll begin to hear a hum and you'll see what I mean the din of the Tao is always there in this ever-present here and now so until and thereafter you learn what is true good health and pax phobis that is peace be with you